Thank you everybody for joining this press conference. Our matter this morning is the notice given by the United Nations Working Group of Experts on People of African Descent. Uh, the United Nations Working Group on Experts of People of African Descent filed an amicus brief on behalf of Mumia Abu-Jamal on December 6, 2022. The brief calls the Abu-Jamal case, quote, emblematic of the problems of racial discrimination faced by people of African descent living in the diaspora, unquote. Its objective is to contribute, quote, to the analysis of systemic racism vis-a-vis -vis the criminal justice system, unquote. Mumia Bujamal is the imprisoned radio journalist and veteran Black Panther who was wrongfully convicted and sentenced to death for killing white police officer Daniel Faulkner in Philadelphia. He was convicted in 1982 and the event happened on December 9th, 1981. In 2010, a federal judge ruled his death sentence unconstitutional and after serving a wrongful sentence, for 28 and a half years, that's a wrongful death sentence, for 28 and a half years in solitary confinement on death row, he was released to general population to serve a sentence of life in prison without parole in 2011. My name is Johanna Fernandez. I'm Associate Professor of History at Baruch College of the City University of New York. I'm the writer and executive producer of the film Justice on Trial, the case of Mumia Abu-Jamal. We will first hear from Julia Wright, who's the daughter of author Richard Wright. She is uh, in the board of the Richard Wright Civil Rights Center, and uh, she's the founder of the Mumia Abu-Jamal Health Committee. Julia. Julie, I think you need to be unmuted. Why do I think this amicus brief is already a milestone abolitionist document? Because it has historical connections. The first connection is Mumia. Mumia Abu Jamal is already part of our Black history not only because of the textbook case aspect of his ordeal, not only because there are two streets in France named after him, not only because, as Lynn Washington puts it, he is a Black journalist behind bars who has written more than 95% articles compared to journalists outside and in America, not only because he is one of our best Black writers and historians, but simply because he is beloved by the voiceless. The other two interconnections are with two ancestors who are rooted in our abolitionist reference, I was going to say in our abolitionist unconscious, George Floyd and how he died, Russell Maroon Schultz and how he died. George Floyd's last breath went around the world and the worldwide protests that ensued shook the United Nations to the core. After hearing the narrative of George Floyd's brother, all 54 African states, members of the United Nations, wrote a letter of solidarity to us in our collective mourning and requested a UN investigation into law enforcement on US soil. This is a letter, William Patterson, Paul Robeson, 
Malcolm X and my father would have smiled upon. This is a letter, part of our history, and it influenced the final resolution that brought about the landmark July 2021 report on racial justice and equality in law enforcement by the Human Rights High Commissioner. The letter initiated by Burkina Faso is what I call today a true rise of Pan-African public opinion, united African public opinion. In his recent letter of thanks to these African states and their allies, Mumia writes that their attempt that, I'm sorry, is, are you still hearing me? Hello? Yes. yes, we're Mumia, here. Okay, Mumia writes that their attempts, quote, gave hope to those living on the brink in U.S. ghettos and prisons on death rows and beyond. So I believe this brief is inspired by the last breath of George Floyd and the global South's response to it. It is also inspired by the realization that Mumia's frame up took place in a world where police narratives still held sway before Eric Garner and George Floyd. Today, in a post George Floyd and a post Uvalde world, police narratives are in the dock. Similarly, the police narrative surrounding Mumia will now hopefully be seen through a different, more demanding lens. The second interconnection with this brief our late, is our late beloved prisoner, Russell Maroon Schultz. In October 2021, I was invited to the UN to speak on mass incarceration. I had three minutes. Our prison work is about time. The prisoners do time. Their prognosis gives them no time. While the courts drag out the time of their appeals, and when we stand to speak of them, we must triage because we have no time. So that day I had to triage. Who would I speak of? Of Mumia's heart condition or Maroon? I spoke of Maroon because he was dying. But that was the day I knew we needed a Mumia health committee. And so I gathered a group of activists to work to stop the triage, unite with other political prisoners, health committees with a collective voice to interface with the community at large, with impacted families, with NGOs, and with the UN. Our message, our elderly comorbid prisoners, primarily the political ones, are subjected to a death by incarceration that is torture. So to conclude, I believe this amicus, the result of nearly two years of toing of froing with the UN Human Rights Council is founded on the immediacy with which it was written by the working group of experts on peoples of African descent, the absence of red tape involved, the deep listening on their part and their ability to go to the roots of the case. And it is the result of their recognition 
that racism is a crime against humanity that cannot be time barred, that state and court decisions should be continuously reinterrogated in the, in the light of the slavery old harms of systemic racism that evidence of racial bias, even decades old, has no expiry date, and that Mumia's case is the tip of a very dangerous white supremacist iceberg. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. We'll next hear from Dr. Vijay Prashad, Executive Director of, the, of Tricontinental, uh, Institute for Research, for Social Research, the, the director of the Tricontinental, which is an institute for social research, um, and it has offices in Buenos Aires, Johannesburg, New Delhi, and Sao Paulo. Vijay. Um, it's great to be here. Obviously, I would prefer if I was in person with Mumia Abu Jamal walking freely in the streets of Philadelphia, um, that would be the best case scenario. Uh, close to that, but not exactly, is the fact that the United Nations has finally weighed in with this important amicus brief. You know, for a very long time, the United States of America has lectured the planet about human rights and democracy. It's made it a habit, in fact, of sanctioning countries that it claims are not democratic up to a certain democratic standard and so on. Over 30 countries, by the way, are under U.S. unilateral and therefore illegal sanctions. Um, they are illegal because they're not authorized by the United Nations. The United Nations is a body that comprises 193 countries who are treaty bound. Uh, and that's an important phrase. They are treaty bound to, um, to follow the U.N. Charter of 1945. The U.N. Charter is the greatest compromise document on the planet because 193 countries are treaty bound by that charter and yet the charter is violated uh, routinely. That's the reason why uh, a number of important people from the United States submitted a text called We Charge Genocide in 1948 about the systematic attack at people of African descent inside the United States. This has a long history, this history of appealing to the United Nations. And finally, in a way, the United Nations has answered not only to the case of Mumia Abu Jamal, but in fact, in a small way, to the great text called We Charge Genocide from 1948. Where does one even begin on this story? I mean, what is there left to say? The numbers say it all. The United States is well known to be the world's largest per capita incarcerator of human beings. Two million people. Um, that's a fact. What is there to say? Uh, do we need to talk about the disproportionality with which uh, people of African descent and people of Latin American descent and so on disproportionately incarcerated? Do we need to get into that um, by, by a long shot disproportionately incarcerated? The numbers, in fact, say it all. Um, obscene numbers of people killed every year by the police departments of the United States. I mean, a thousand people a year is the official statistic. That's about three people a day almost. Um, the numbers say it all. What is one to say? And again, here, close look at those statistics done by the Washington Post, a venerable institution of, of the United States. Um, it shows disproportionate killing of people of African descent, people of Latin American descent and so on. The numbers say it all. What do we have to contribute to that? It's right there on the record. It's about time somebody took those numbers seriously. Well, the people in the United States know those numbers. Punctual protests every few years on the streets for this or that killing of one individual who exemplifies the killing of thousands of people. Um, it was Michael Brown in 2014 in Ferguson a cycle of protest starts against police violence. And then, uh, you know, just a few years later, the killing of George Floyd in 2020, the Black Lives Matter movement starts. Black Lives Matter, an important slogan. Almost 26 million people in the United States take to the streets. 
That's the largest mass demonstration in US history. In some ways forgotten. And I remember those protests. I remember seeing photographs in the midst of those protests, Black Lives Matter. There were signs which said free Mumia. Free Mumia said the protesters in the Black Lives Matter protests around the horrendous killing of a man named George Floyd. Free Mumia. What did Mumia Jam Abu Jamal have to do with this? Um, his is, in fact, an individual case. 41 years incarcerated. What does it have to do with something in 2020? Well, everything. In one respect, the slogan Free Mumia is a slogan that, as the United Nations recognizes, is about the person, Mumia Abu Jamal, unjustly sitting in a prison for 41 years. In most countries, a life sentence is about 10 to 25 years. Most countries, civilized countries in the world, do not hold people to what in the United States is known the length of their natural life. That is inhumane. That's a human rights violation. Most countries, when people are sentenced to life, it's understood to be 10 years and then parole or 25 years. 41 years, that's an atrocity. And the United Nations has recognized that. Free Mumia, it means free Mumia. But free Mumia also means something else. Because of the great compassion of Mumia Abu Jamal, he has become a symbol not only of his own case, but of the case of systematic racism in the United States. Systematic racism, that phrase which one hears even from people in power in the United States. It means racism has corroded the entire system. The system lives on the basis of racism. That's what the system is. The system requires changing. A system of systematic racism lecturing the world about human rights and democracy? Stop. Look to yourself. Look to your own problems. Take seriously what the United Nations has said about the case of Mumia Abu Jamal. Free Mumia. That's about Mumia Abu Jamal, the individual. Free Mumia. That's about a system that is rotten and that is desperately crying out cycle after cycle of protests. Black Lives Matter, stop the violence, stop police violence. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Vijay. Um, I think it's important to underscore that what the UN brief uh, suggests is that there are echoes of the past, of the country's racist past in uh, the case of Mumia Abu-Jamal. Uh, it shocks the conscience that in the post George Floyd world, Abu Jamal has for 41 years been refused relief in the courts. Mumia was beaten within an inch of his life by police officers after having been shot uh, in the stomach by Officer Faulkner. This is something that is forgotten about this case. The prosecutor, Joe McGill, bribed a testimony out of star witness Robert Chobert, who was driving with two DWIs, no license, and had been previously convicted of throwing a Molotov cocktail into a schoolyard. This is the new evidence that has emerged. A handwritten letter penned by the star witness, Robert Chobert, asking, where is my money? The judge who presided over the case um, initially, Judge Albert Sabo was overheard by a court stenographer say, quote, I'm going to help them fry the nigger, referring to how he was going to instruct the jury. The only thing Mumia is guilty of is having survived an encounter with the infamously brutal and corrupt Philadelphia police of the late 1970s and 1980s. Um, and this police department was under investigation at the time by the Department of Justice for brutality, corruption, and tampering with evidence to obtain convictions. In fact, that term shocks the conscience is in the documents produced by the DOJ about the Philadelphia police. They said that the level of brutality um, and homicidal violence of the Philadelphia Police Department and its tampering with evidence to obtain convictions shocks the conscience. And we are here today again to talk about the echoes 
of the racist past in Mumia's case. And next to talk about um, this, we'll hear from Lynn Washington Jr., who's a Philadelphia-based investigative reporter who has covered the Mumia Abu-Jamal matter since Abu-Jamal's arrest on the morning of December 9th, 1981. Lynn. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fernandez. The UN brief um, speaks very eloquently and quite instructively on the historic and deep-seated nature of racism in the US criminal justice system, as well as the civil justice system. One of the things that's been, um, I would argue, most overlooked in this case, uh, there's been a lot of focus, and rightfully, on the improprieties of police and prosecutors, but very little on the judges that have handled this. Judges in this case have whitewashed the racism um, that has been extraordinarily evident since the actual beating of Abu Jamal on December 9th, 1981 by police that happened even before he was formally arrested. The honorable um, jurist that you'll hear from this morning uh, is from um, Little Rock, Arkansas. And the very first African-American judge that was elected to a judgeship in the United States took place in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1873. That man's name was Mifflin Gibbs. He was a Philadelphia native. And again, talking about the brief, it talks about the deep-seated and historic nature of racism in the United States, including other courts. And Mr. Gibbs, before he became a judge, when he was an activist and successful entrepreneur in California, protested against a practice in California that barred African-Americans from being able to testify in courts against whites. So when we talk about the effect that the courts have had on black people, say in California, somebody's land was stolen, a black person's land was stolen, they couldn't even go into court and articulate it unless a white person was there vouching for them. That just shows you the long arc of racism uh, in the US criminal justice system. I would like to just reference an item that was in the, um, the item mark number 35 in the UN brief. And they talk about the judge, the trial judge in the case, the late uh, Albert um, Sabo. And the, he was specifically quoted as saying he was going to help them fry the N-word. Now, all of us, or uh, well, many people react to the use of that, that odious phrase, uh, the N-word. And I think we should really start using that phrase because putting it in the context of the N-word really dissipates some of its impact. But the worst aspect of this was the judge openly saying that he was going to help prosecutors convict this man. He would do whatever he can, bend or break the law to make sure that this person was convicted. That goes to the core of an unfair trial and shows gross impartiality, uh, or should I say gross partiality from the judge, which violates a judge's duty to impartiality, which is in the code of uh, conduct for judges in Pennsylvania. When we look at the 1982 trial, this judge who promised to help prosecutors fry the N-word, fry Mumia, uh, he stripped Mumia of his right to represent himself. He stripped him from being able to finish the jury selection. There was a lot of things that the judge did overtly and covertly to help prosecutors. Uh, dismissing jurors when he allowed other jurors to have the same sort of uh, relief that the jurors that he dismissed was asked, um, blocking certain testimony coming in. The judge threw the trial. Now, when that judge's bias was an issue in Mumia's appeals in the mid-90s, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court allowed the judge to continue to stay on the case a classic and obvious example of the Fox being put in charge of the hen house. Sabo's bias in that 1995 hearing was so extraordinary that reporters from around the world, from Philadelphia to Florida, from New York to LA, to London, to Japan, criticized the ruling. The, the 
actions of Sabo were so outrageous that Philadelphia's media that was normally anti-Abu Jamal was critical of what Sabo was doing. The two daily newspapers, the Philadelphia Inquirer and the Daily News, both wrote editorials critical of Judge Sabo's demeanor and behavior during that trial. But when it came up to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, what happened? The Pennsylvania Supreme Court haughtily said, oh, the opinions of a handful of journalists do not convince us that Sabo was biased. Although they said Sabo made intemperate remarks and acted in, in, in violation of judicial decorum. Now, let's, let's look at the words. Judges' rulings are supposed to be precise in their wording. Handful means six or less of whatever you can grab in your hands. The members that were on the editorial boards of both the Daily News and the Inquirer were over a dozen people. So that's more than a handful. So we can see the shenanigans that the courts are playing with words. During that 1998 ruling, there was a, ju a justice on the case one named Ron Castile. Ron Castile was the former DA of Philadelphia, who as DA worked diligently against any appeals for Abu Jamal. Uh, Justice Castile was asked to not participate in that ruling because of his role as DA and also because he received financial and campaign support historically from Philadelphia's police union, the Fraternal Order of Police, the main organization that at the time was seeking the execution of Abu Jamal. So what did Judge uh, Justice Castile do? In his ruling saying that he would not recuse himself from the case as the code of conduct required, he went on to identify four other judges on the Supreme Court that had received campaign funds from the FOP saying, why criticize me when these other justices also received the same sort of support? So here we had five members of a seven member court taking money and who knows what else from the main group seeking Abu Jamal's execution. I don't think in any rational world, and we live in an irrational world, that that would satisfy any tenets of fairness. That's why you have the UN brief as well as Amnesty International and governmental entities around the world saying that Abu Jamal's conviction violated any kind of international standards. I'm gonna do this real quick because the issue of Sabo's bias, that particular phrasing, I'm gonna help them fry the N word, that came up uh, as an issue in appeal. One judge, a Philadelphia court judge said, um, no, nah, no big deal. It was a jury trial, so whatever Sabo did, even if he was racist, didn't have an impact on it. Please stop, just stop. Everything that Sabo did in that courtroom had an effect on what the jury would hear. And if Sabo made rulings, which he did, that kept evidence away from the jurors, they didn't have all of the information to make the ruling. When that case uh, that just eliminated uh, any kind of harm or violation by Sabo went to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, the judge who uh, wrote the opinion upholding the lower court judge saying no harm, no foul with this brutal racism, as well as a bias for prosecutors, said that, hey, no big deal. And furthermore, we've already ruled on this because in 1990, in 98, when we said that there was no bias in 95 and 82, this is the same thing all over again. Well, it wasn't. It was different evidence, but they again whitewashed it. And I might add that the judge who issued that opinion in 2003, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court Justice, a guy named Aiken, years later, he was forced to resign from the court because he participated in sending racist, sexist, homophobic, and anti-Islamic emails on the state computer system. And that involved other judges and members of the state attorney general's office. So you could see how deeply racism is baked into this. When we talk about racism in terms of judges in the judiciary, we see very clearly that this is a whitewash case. It's extraordinary that in all of the dozens of judges that have handled this case, only two have been African-American. One was a judge named Leon Tucker, a Philadelphia court judge. And for the first time ever in over three decades of judicial rulings on this case was the word justice used in the context of Abu Jamal 
when Judge Tucker uh, over, uh, overturned the case and said that Amelia was entitled to new appeals. That was brushed aside. And now we have this new evidence, six boxes of material, evidence in those materials. Those boxes of information were uh, found in the DA's office. They had been kept secret and more importantly, kept away from Abu Jamal's defense team for 36 years in violation of federal and state court rulings and local law saying that materials should be turned over promptly. So what the UN's brief found that there was abundant racism, and it stated that that racism included violations of the right to a fair trial. And if you don't have that right to a fair trial, then you have all your rights violated. And that's what happened with Abu Jamal. The UN uh, brief says confront and don't ignore the racism. And that is now what is uh, on the table or on the bench in front of Judge uh, Clemens uh, who's now handling an African-American female judge, is she going to ignore the very obvious racism and do her uh, or do her judicial duty to justice and find that there is racism and other violations that are very evident that you don't need to be a judge or a lawyer or a law school graduate to see? Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, uh, Lynn. The other issue underscored by the UN brief is the Batson claim. Batson versus Kentucky is a landmark Supreme Court case um, that bars discrimination in jury selection. Uh, and if you uh, are able to win a Batson claim, your case is often thrown out entirely and you are set free or you get a new trial. And the bar for proving the Batson claim is very low. In the case of Mumi Abu Jamal, 11 out of 15 potential jurors were struck out with peremptory challenges. Um, this issue went before the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. In 2008, that court ruled, and a dissenting judge, Tom Ambro, said in his dissenting opinion, quote, I see no reason why this court should not afford Abu Jamal the courtesy of our precedents. If our uh, attorneys had the new evidence that emerged in 2018 and late 2018 under uh, Leon Tucker, um, Mumia would have gotten the Batson claim. Why? Because we found in the new evidence a piece of paper wherein the prosecutor, Joe McGill, tracks the race of each of the potential jurors. Um, so this is the new evidence that is emerging, has emerged, uh, and is being uh, decided on finally um, on December 16th of um, this year, which is Friday. Uh, so we will be in court on Friday. Next, I will like to I would like to bring um, to the spotlight the Honorable Wendell Wendell Griffin, who's state court trial judge in the Sixth Judicial Circuit of Arkansas. Judge Wendell Griffin. Thank you, Dr. Fernandez, and I want to echo not only what you just said with great precision, but also the remarks that have been made by the speakers before me. I would, in my time, thank the UN for raising a challenge to the rule of law hypocrisy that characterizes so much of the judicial rhetoric that we hear concerning the Mumia Abu Jamal case. Uh, often we hear judges talk about following the rule of law and following precedent. But as the dissenting judge mentioned, uh, Mumia Jamal has been denied the opportunity to gain the benefit of court precedence. The most recent example 
glaring is the fact that six boxes of evidence were discovered, if you want to use that term, uh, decades after Mamiya Jamal was arrested, charged, prosecuted, tried, convicted, sentenced to death, appealed, spent decades on death row, had his death row sentence overturned, and even decades later, fighting for justice, this evidence had not been disclosed to the defense team. When in 1963, the United States Supreme Court in the case of Brady versus Maryland held that due process of law requires that prosecutors reveal any exculpatory evidence to defense counsel and that the failure to do so, that concealment of exculpatory evidence violates fundamental fairness, what we call due process. An earlier case cited in Brady, dated 1935, said that when you have that kind of concealment, you have a pretense of a trial. Now, in 2022, the importance of the UN amicus brief is that it calls on the American justice system and specifically Judge Lucretia Clemens to answer the question whether or not she will say that Mumia Jamal had a pretense of a trial. A pretense of a trial when prosecutors were allowed to engage in flagrant abuses of Batson as Dr. Fernandez has just now mentioned, but also a pretense of a trial to the extent that exculpatory evidence was knowingly concealed and kept from Jamal's defense team for decades. 2019 was when it was discovered. This is now 2022. And the question now is, 40 years after Jamal's trial and conviction, is whether or not Judge Lucretia Clemens will have the courage and the integrity to decide that Mamiya Jamal is entitled, he has a right to benefit from the decisions that say that concealment of evidence, exculpatory evidence, violates fundamental fairness. If there is such a thing as due process of law, if the rule of law means anything, Judge Clemens should decide this case in one way. First, she should decide that Mamiya Jamal was denied due process. Exculpatory evidence was concealed from him, from his defense counsel, so that he was not able to use it at trial on the issue of guilt or punishment. That's a violation of due process. Secondly, the remedy is clear. There is nothing that Mamiya Jamal could have done to discover this evidence. This is not something that he could have or his defense team could have remedied. And therefore, the only remedy for this is for him to be released from what is only an unjust conviction and an unjust sentence. The question is, why would that not happen? Why if there is a 60, almost 60 year history of court precedent since Brady versus Maryland in 1963, that says that concealing exculpatory evidence violates due process, and in Brady, a first degree murder charge was overturned. In 
Mooney versus Hollihan in a California case in 1935, a first degree murder charge was overturned, conviction overturned. And so the question is, why not Mamiya? Why not Mamiya Abu Shimo? The question might be answered this way. Perhaps our criminal, and I don't call it a criminal justice system. Let's stop using that term. It's a criminal punishment system. Its aim is not justice. Its aim is punishment. And, yeah. mm -hmm. and the reason why Mamiya Abu Jamal is in prison now is because the system is geared toward punishing, not justice. And the people who are targets most and first for punishment are black, brown, and radical, liberating minded people. Mamiya Jamal can be set free if Judge Clemens is committed to justice and not to punishment. And if she is committed to following the precedent, giving Mumia the benefit of precedent that existed long before 1982 his, when he was tried. I cited you to a 1935 case from California, 50 years before Mamiya was tried. And so the relief that he is entitled to is relief that the American system of courts have recognized as entitled for people whose due process rights have been violated. The question is whether or not Judge Lucretia Clemens has the courage and the institutional integrity to grant it. I will conclude on this notion. As a state court trial judge who has tried murder cases and presided over murder cases, I understand the pressures that weigh on judges to defer to public opinion and especially to police opinion. However, as someone from Arkansas, the case of Moore versus Dempsey arising from the Elaine Race Massacre of 1919, a 1923 case in the US Supreme Court speaks very loudly to me. In that case, five black men were tried and convicted of murder in less than 30 minutes in a mob dominated trial. And the Supreme Court of the United States overturned that conviction and held they were entitled to a new trial based upon a habeas petition brought on their behalf. Mamiya Abu Jamal is entitled to the same kind of relief. The UN working group says so. The question is whether or not a judge in Philadelphia has the courage to say so, Mamiya's freedom lies on that question. Thank you. Thank you so very much for your remarks, Judge Griffin. We're gonna hear briefly from Michael Schiffman, Dr. Michael Schiffman, before we open it up for questions and answers. Um, Dr. Schiffman. Yeah, thank you. I've been involved in this since 1999, and I'm the author of a book that appeared in press, in print, in German, and which is on the internet in English, Race Against Death. And as Jana said, I will be very brief. Uh, I will also talk about the elephant in the room in Mumia's, uh, in Mumia Abu Jamal's case, namely racism. And 
1998, Professor David Spaldus and George Woodworth of the University of Iowa published a 10 year study from 1990, 1983 to 1993 uh, on death row cases in Philadelphia. And uh, they focused on the issue of jury selection. What they found was that the likelihood, the average likelihood for a black potential juror to be parentorally stricken uh, as compared to a white one was four to one over this whole period, showing endemic racism, racism in the system. In 1999, Abu Jamal's defense uh, in their habeas corpus petition uh, brought on different statistics and they were related to the behavior of the prosecutor in the case, Joseph McGill, in the six cases he handled from 1981 to 1983. In this case, the likelihood uh, for a black juror to be struck peremptorily by the prosecutor rose to 8.5 to 1, showing what kind of person and what kind of prosecutor Joseph McGill was. And when we now focus on the case of Mumia Abu Jamal, what we find is that the likelihood for black jurors to be peremptorily stricken by Joseph McGill rises to 10 to 1 at least. And potentially, one, the racial uh, um, identity of one of the jurors could not be clarified because the defense was prevented from doing so, uh, potentially even to 14 to 1. And uh, to my mind, this shows everything about the case. This is the background to the new notes that were found. Uh, all details uh, can be discussed when we uh, hand over to the, when we go over to, to the question session, but these numbers should not be forgotten. They tell you everything about racism and juror selection in this case. Thank you, Dr. Schiffman. Uh, Dr. Schiffman is a professor um, at the University of Heidelberg, and he teaches in the Department of English Studies. Um, I'd like to open it up to the press for questions. Uh, perhaps uh, you can raise your hand um, and you can find that in the reactions bar at the very bottom, or you can just turn on your mic. Uh, Betsy Piet. Uh, yes, Betsy Piet with Workers World Newspaper. Uh, one is, I understand that there's uh, a court ruling this coming Friday, uh, December 16th. Could you say anything about that? Um, would anybody like to say something about that? The court ruling is this um, Friday, December 16th. Um, the judge, Lucretia Clemens, um, issued an intent to dismiss ruling back in October when we met. And that means that she intends to dismiss the request to formally review the new evidence, um, which is not inconsequential. Uh, a letter written by the lead uh, witness in the case, the star witness, um, uh, Robert Chobert, Penn with his hand, um, asking Joe McGill about money promised to him. Uh, this suggests that his testimony was bribed. Um, and there is evidence that uh, Robert Chobert was not where he said he was. In fact, Dr. Michael Schiffman um, discovered what are known now as the Polakoff photographs, photographs taken by the first photojournalist at the crime scene, Pedro Polakoff. Um, those photographs show that Robert Chobert was not where he said he was. Um, his taxi cab, uh, he claimed, was immediately behind Officer Faulkner's um, police car. And those photographs taken within 15 minutes um, of the event 
uh, show absolutely no car behind um, uh, the officer's car. Um, and the photos show a lot of tampering with evidence, a lot of moving parts, including the fact that the police mishandled the evidence. Uh, there were allegedly two guns retrieved at the crime scene and um, Officer Forbes, who testified in court that he properly handled the guns, uh, is seen holding uh, the guns with his bare hands. Um, so uh, there's that evidence. There's also evidence that another uh, key witness, Cynthia White, um, who was facing over 30 charges because she was a sex worker, um, there is a whole line of documents wherein the lead prosecutor, Joe McGill, is tracking her court dates and insisting that nothing be decided about convictions without first um, uh, talking to him. Um, and then there is, you know, the bloody glove uh, of Joe McGill tracking the race of each of the jurors uh, with his own handwriting. And what Mumia's attorneys are requesting is a proper evidential hearing on, um, on this new evidence. Uh, Judge Lucretia Clemens will make a final decision on December 6th, uh, eight o'clock at the Court of Common Pleas. Any other uh, questions? Perhaps one uh, one question that is um, that is often asked is mm. why why has Mumia not prevailed in the courts for 41 years. Shouldn't someone have, um, uh, or some court or some judge have uh, defended his case if in fact um, his grievances are um, worthy of relief? Um, and perhaps Lynn Washington, or perhaps the judge can answer this question. Um, I'll... I'll weigh in on that, uh, Dr. Fernandez. I really think that what Lynn Washington said bears repeating. Mamiya Abu Jamal's case exposes not just police misconduct, it exposes judicial condonation of police misconduct and mm -hmm. judicial basic tolerance of racism in the criminal punishment system. Uh, Judge Bruce Wright famously wrote a book titled Black Robes, White Justice that I read before I began law school decades ago. And Judge Wright wrote that all too often people forget that many people walk into courtrooms and they see black and brown defendants and they see white judges, white prosecutors, uh, oftentimes white defense attorneys, uh, everybody in the courtroom is white. Even at the appellate level, that's even more so. And unfortunately, what we have to deal with is a judicial system that has become essentially numb, blind, and unwilling to acknowledge its own cultural incompetence, its own cultural deadness, its own embrace of white supremacy and racism. And when we expose that, as Mumia's case does, all too often, the people who decide the challenges are, I must say so, culturally unable 
to acknowledge the elephant in their room, as Dr. Schiffman has mentioned. And this is the problem. I think that one of the problems that Judge Clemens is going to have is, does she have the, the courage to say, there is too many, there are too many factors here that compel, that compel relief for Mamiya Jamal to justify dismissing this motion. This evidentiary hearing is required. And what it must also do is it must also lead to a decision, number one, that the evidence, exculpatory evidence was concealed. Number two, it was in a due process violation. Number three, the only remedy for it is to vacate the conviction. And if the Commonwealth wants to try Mamiya again, then they have to do that. But Mamiya must be set free. Now, now that's that's if if you're a law professor. That's the law professor's answer that gets you an A on the question. Anything less than that is a subpar answer. But Judge Clemens has to have the courage to do that. And unfortunately, when we've seen 40 years of judges have lacked that courage. She's only the second black judge. One black judge had that courage, but the majority of judges have not had that courage. And I will say this as a judge, and I've been black a while, quite frankly, one of the problems of being a black judge is having to explain to white peers, and I've been an appellate judge, they are unable to understand their own cultural incompetence and how it affects criminal punishment and justice. This is the challenge. Thank you. Um, any other questions before I give it to Lynn Washington from the audience? You can raise your hand. Um, I don't see any other questions. Lynn Washington. Thank you, Judge Griffin. Yeah, hi. Um, th th there's so much here. And there's so much that just violates what is supposed to be the basic tenets of justice, and that's to have fair representation, both by the defense and the prosecution, to put on their case. When we look at just the issue of, of Judge Sabo saying before trial that he was going to help prosecutors fry the N-word, um, and they weren't using the N-word, he used that word. Um, that alone should have been enough to grant a new trial because that just goes to the very core of what um, is supposed to be sacred with the American criminal justice system. But what we see is judges and justices um, all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court sanctioning misconduct that they have granted other inmates relief for. I mean, it's just uh, absolutely incredible. The U.S. Supreme Court made a ruling that um, Mumia was not entitled to any relief when he made a statement to um, the court, which was called allocution. And that's just a statement. You can't be cross-examined on it. Um, they, uh, The judge, Sabo, who is biased, I'll let the prosecutor come in and add some questions in. The irony with all of this, or one of the multiple ironies, is that months after the U.S. Supreme Court upheld Abu Jamal's conviction, it granted relief to a member of a white racist prison gang in Delaware who had escaped and killed somebody because it said that the um, prosecution had made some errors. So here, the U.S. Supreme Court gave relief to a white racist prison gang member but wouldn't give relief to Abu Jamal, where the prosecutor manipulated facts and law to imply that because Mumia was a member of the Black Panther Party, 
12 years before his arrest that that influenced him to commit this crime on the night of December 9th or the morning of December 9th, 1981. Mumia, on his own appeals to the Supreme Court to look at his case again, they deny it. And then months later, based on their ruling in this Delaware case involving the escaped inmate, they gave the same relief to a man in Nevada who was a member of a devil worshiping um, cult who killed some of his relatives. So here we have a clear example of the US Supreme Court giving relief to a white racist prison gang member, current white racist prison gang member, and a current devil worshiper who was white, but denying it to a person who was a member of the Black Panther Party 12 years before he was charged. There's so many instances of just fundamental unfairness in this case. And this is what is now before Judge Lucretia Clemens. And her preliminary ruling would seem to indicate that she is infected with the same refusal to recognize fundamental rights and fundamental fairness, because there's one passage in her, in her uh, initial intent ruling that says that because the prosecutor was keeping what is in fact illegal notes about the race of the jurors that were being um, picked for the trial, that either Mumia's lawyer or Mumia could have simply looked across the courtroom and looked onto the prosecutor's uh, notepad to see what he was doing and make a contemporaneous objection to it. That is absolutely absurd. Just on the physical dynamics of a courtroom, there is no way that they could have looked and saw what the prosecutor was doing unless they went over and looked at his note, notepad, which would have created an objection. So there are so many flaws in this case, not only with the original 1982 trial, but through so many layers of, of court rulings uh, by appellate courts all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. I mean, it's just ridiculous. When the Third Circuit Court of, Appen uh, Court of Appeals uh, ruled against Abu Jamal, the ruling itself was, you know, maybe 10 or 20 pages, uh, or maybe like 10 pages, but the di dissent, the first dissent ever, the judge who dissented said, uh, who wrote like twice as much as the original opinion saying, why aren't we giving Mr. Jamal the courtesy of our precedent. Why are we changing our precedent just in this one particular case? And when we look at this case, there are repeated and, and just disturbing instances of courts violating their own rules to uphold uh, this particular conviction. Uh, just one quick example. Uh, there was over 20 cases where courts gave relief to persons in Philadelphia in death penalty trials because their lawyer didn't uh, provide any mitigating evidence during the trial. Mumia's attorney at the time did not. And the court said no big deal because Mumia who was barred from the courtroom was in charge of his defense. I mean, they come up with the most preposterous stuff and because they said it, then it should be okay. And that's fundamentally wrong. We have a question from Kalanji Changa. Peace. Um, thanks for putting this together and providing uh, clarity and a concrete analysis. Um, first question is, um, uh, how do you see the public becoming more aware of uh, judicial collusion within uh, uh, with police misconduct? Can you repeat that again? How do you see the public becoming more aware of judicial collusion uh, with police misconduct? Um, anyone want to tackle this question? Well, it, it just depends on where you want to start. <laughs> There's so many uh, instances of this. I, I think a quick primer would be the Amnesty International um, organization. They did a report on the Abu Jamal case that came out in February of uh, the 2000. It's only 35 pages. It's a quick read. You don't have to be a lawyer to understand it. And that really lays out multiple layers, You know, trial layers, appellate court layers, and everything of uh, what happened to Abu Jamal. And you can see how not only trial courts, but appellate court judges um, have 
conscientiously uh, worked against Abu Jamal. There's one passage in there where they look at the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, where the former district attorney of Philadelphia, when he went up to the and became a member of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, despite him opposing Abu Jamal's appeals as DA, he sat on the case and ruled on it. And they came to the conclusion, uh, many, many conclusions, one of which the judge who Abu Jamal's attorney said, hey, you shouldn't be sitting on this because you were Philadelphia's DA and you fought against it. One of his responses were like, was, why are you criticizing me? Because there are four other members on this court that have also received campaign funding and backing from the Philadelphia Police Union that you're criticizing me for getting court you know, funding from. So here you had five members of a seven member court in the pocket of the main group that was opposed to any kind of justice for Abu Jamal. That type of injustice would probably shock the conscience of even China and Russia, where they make no pretense of following the law. But that is not the most extraordinary example. It's just one of many in the Abu Jamal case. That's why people around the world see this as a fundamental injustice and a blot on the American judicial system. Fox 29 News is um, on this uh, Zoom call, and I wonder if Fox News or perhaps George Bruschetto um, have questions for, for the panel. I just want to um, give them a minute to consider asking a question. Even if on the chat. Um, all right. Um, Dr. Benitez? Yes, uh, Judge Griffin, go right ahead. The question that was posed about what can be done to get the public more aware of judicial condonation of this kind of bigotry is one that invites us to remember that more people are doing court watching. Mm. More groups are intentionally watching cases and not just the so-called high profile cases. There are groups in more and more communities that are intentionally watching, monitoring, how judges hold court, how judges deal with and dispose of cases, and what are patterns that judges exhibit in the way they deal with cases. I think this is a good thing. I hope that it happens in more locations, but I would encourage more of us to in be involved in that in activity because quite frankly, uh, what happens in these cases affects all of us. It has a bearing on all of us. While the individual defendant may be the person who is involved, Mamiya is us. Mamiya is all of us. And as goes Mamiya, so goes the issue of justice for every soul. And so the more court watchers we have, the better it will be for people like Mamiya. Thank you so very much. And that's really um, important for this coming court date. We're asking people to show up at the court uh, eight eight thirty. 8.30. Um, there will be opportunity to go in, although there's limited room, but there will be a demonstration outside, outside the Court of Common Pleas in uh, Philadelphia. Julia Wright. For people like Mamiya. Julia, you are muted. I agree with Judge Griffin, and that sends me back to young Mumia, who would go into the ghetto, who that's where he was born in the projects, with his notebook because there was no um, iPhone and a pencil. And when he saw 
police brutality, he would note it down. He would note down the number and he would go to court and he would watch the trial. Julia, um, we have a question from Renee at Democracy Now. Can you say how Mumia's health is right now? Uh, I will defer to Mark. Mark Taylor is not with us. He had to leave for class. Okay. Uh, the, uh, in the Mumia Health Committee, our conclusion is freedom is the only treatment for elders who are comorbid, who are in prisons where food, though it's a human uh, right, is actually poison, where there's no ventilation, where it is so cold that the other day in Pennsylvania, a young man uh, was hospitalized for hypothermia, was put back into the same cell and died. Uh, Mumia's health is that he has been, since he left hospital for double by bypass surgery a year and a half ago, he has been claiming uh, the cardiac diet prescribed to him by the surgeon who operated on him. For a year and a half, Mumia has filed these claims with the Department of Corrections. For a year and a half, Mumia, who is a jailhouse lawyer, who has won so many of his fellow detainees' lawsuits, has been unable to access that diet, which is recognized as, as a disability by the American Disability Association, especially behind bars. Prognosis, congestive heart disease, a person who suffers from that, I'm sorry, dies. 50% of them die within five years. But if you're in prison and you don't get access to the cardiac diet, uh, the prognosis has to be revised accordingly. I want to remind everybody that there is a bus leaving from New York City to Philadelphia on December 16th. And if you'd like to purchase tickets, you can go to bringmumia.com, www.bringmumiahome, bringmumiahome.com. Um, the tickets are $30, but there are scholarships for those who cannot afford um, the bus ticket. Uh, the bus is leaving at 5.30 a.m. from 17th Street and Park Avenue. Um, 17th Street and Park Avenue. You, you meet at that address at 5.30 in New York City, and the bus departs promptly at 6 a.m. Um, protests outside of the courtroom starts at 8.30. Um, and that's at the Court of Common Pleas. Uh, in Philadelphia. Any other questions before we wrap up this conference? Uh, Kalanji, do you have another question? Yes, I was just going to ask for Please. those of us who um, are in different parts of the country and won't be able to make it out to uh, Philly on Friday. Are there any um, uh, marching orders or suggestions for members of our organization or for our platform, how they can support Beyond uh, Friday? Uh, yes, you can go to Love Not Fear, fear spelled with a P-H uh, dot com, lovenotfear.com for instructions on how the movement 
is uh, is handling uh, this matter in the run up to Friday, but also beyond uh, Friday. But Jamal uh, Jr. is on the line and perhaps he would like to say something. And, and Jamal Jr. is Mumia's grandson. Um, George Bruschetta, you you are your your camera is on, and we appreciate that. Uh, would you like to um, ask a question? You can unmute yourself. Yes, I, I have unmuted myself. <clears throat> I don't think it's appropriate for me to comment in as much as I have been involved in the case <clears throat> at various stages and at various levels. I do, uh, I do appreciate, however, the opportunity um, to hear everybody's point of view. And uh, I, I congratulate whoever has conducted this uh, Zoom conference because that person I'm sure knows who I am and nevertheless allowed me to observe it. And I, I salute that. Uh, I think transparency is important. And I appreciate the opportunity to hear different points of view and other points of view. I've taken uh, careful notes and uh, I take this very, very seriously. But beyond that, I, I don't think it would be appropriate for me to comment. Thank you, Mr. Bruschetto. Um, just to let people know, and thank you for your ethics in this matter of not uh, commenting. Um, uh, Mr. Bruschetto is the attorney of the Fraternal Order of Police uh, currently. Um, and I would, as a professor of history, American history, but also as the um, executive producer and director of the film Justice on Trial, having done a lot of research, would like to raise the issue of um, police violence and police corruption and tampering with evidence to obtain convictions in, in all cases in Philadelphia, um, but especially in cases in the late 1970s and early 1980s. Um, the entire police department in Philadelphia was investigated at different levels, at the state level, by city council, and by the Department of Justice. Um, and again, that study by the Department of Justice said that the level of homicidal violence on the part of the Philadelphia police um, against uh, uh, those arrested who were Latino and Black and the level of corruption and tampering with evidence to obtain convictions, quote, shocks the conscience. And of the fifth of the 35 police officers involved in Mumia's case, approximately a third of them were convicted and jailed precisely for tampering with evidence and corruption in other cases. Unfortunately, the jury that heard Mumia's case was not aware that these police officers were under investigation. The reason why um, discrimination in jury selection is so important is because Black people have a different relationship with the police in American society. And so Black jurors would have called into question the testimony of Officer Forbes, who said that he properly handled the guns at the crime scene and in fact did not because he is pictured mishandling the guns in photographs taken by a white um, photojournalist, the first person to arrive at the crime scene, Pedro Polakoff. Um, so, so this issue is foundational and we're living in the post George Floyd moment where again, we know the consequences of um, police violence uh, and police brutality. And if Mumia's case were happening right now, um, the outcome of this case 
would surely have been different. So I'd like you um, to consider these facts. Um, and I know that Lynn Washington has studied police violence and brutality and tampering with evidence. And this is not um, confined to this era. Every five years, there's a massive a scandal of police corruption and violence in Philadelphia. Um, so uh, the, these were the people who um, who who testified uh, in court. People who were later jailed, uh, not not long after Mumia's case. Judge uh, Griffin, uh, before you speak, I'm wondering if anyone else would like to speak who has not spoken in the panel or would like to ask questions. And let me just check the, um, the, uh, the chat here. Okay. By the way, <clears throat> yes. by the way Professor uh, Fernandez, uh, just by way of clarification, uh, I represent not the FOP. I represent uh, the widow Maureen Faulkner and only Maureen Faulkner in these matters. Oh, and, and thank you so very much, um, Mr. Bruschetto, um, Attorney Bruschetto for that. Um, and we here in the movement to free Mumia Abu Jamal, we wanna know who killed Officer Faulkner. Justice in this case will actually um, lead to healing uh, because our object is to pursue the real shooter who a, a um uh an investigative journalist um uh whose name escapes me right now um uh he wrote for TV guy this is a mainstream investigation uh, crimes investigation journalist um o'connor <laughs> uh patrick o'connor believes that there was a fourth person at the crime scene whose name is Kenneth Freeman. Joe McGill acknowledged the presence of Kenneth Freeman in the case of the brother of Mumia um, that was happening concurrently, but denied the presence of a fourth person in the trial of Mumia Abu Jamal. Why? There was a fourth person According to this uh, crimes investigation journalist, Patrick O'Connor, who wrote for TV News, it doesn't get more mainstream than that. He did the work and he says that Kenneth Freeman shot Officer Faulkner. Why? Because Billy Cook, the brother um, of Mumia, um, who was being beaten by Officer Faulkner while handcuffed, was the business partner of Kenneth Freeman. They were together in their car because they had just shut down the newsstand they co-owned in downtown um, Philadelphia when they were stopped by um, uh, by by Officer Faulkner. And in fact, Officer Faulkner's hat is first seen in the driver's seat of um, Billy Cook's car, suggesting that he took off his hat to talk to the passenger who was Kenneth Freeman. And Kenneth Freeman, by the way, was found dead, gagged and handcuffed in a, in a playground the night that uh, the MOVE people were, were bombed in Philadelphia. Um, so uh, these are facts. This was written up in the Philadelphia newspapers um, that Ken, Kenneth Freeman, the, um, the, the, the business partner of Billy Cook, um, was killed on the night that the MOVE people were bombed in Philadelphia. Judge Wendell Griffin. Thank you, Dr. Fernandez. The issues that you are speaking about now and that Mr. Borchetto spoke about are issues that go to the heart of why it is so important for us to hold judges accountable for ignoring police misconduct and for ignoring bigotry in policing. There is a murderer aloose. 
there is a widow whose husband was killed, but there is also an innocent man who's been wrongly convicted. A conviction based upon contrived evidence is a pretense of a trial. That's in our court proceedings. That's not due process. And therefore, Mamiya is a victim. Officer Faulkner's family has been victimized. The people deserve to have judges who will hold prosecutors and policing accountable for doing right, not only by the victims of violence, but also doing right for people who are accused and wrongly prosecuted based upon misconduct by police and misconduct by judges and prosecutors. This is a situation where our court system is culpable. And if Mamiya is not set free, not only will the Faulkner family continue to be victimized, Mamiya will be victimized, and the fault lies at judicial level. The fault stops with the judges. Thank you. Anyone else like to weigh in here in this conversation? I would like to um, ask for final remarks from our panelists before we conclude this press conference. So we will start with Julia. Brief, please. One thought, and I don't remember her name and I don't remember the name of the defendant but it's just the memory of a judge in Missouri, I believe, who sentenced uh, this defendant who was black to life and who let him live in jail for years and then realized that she had made a mistake, helped to free him, and is at the time I'm speaking, helping him to rehabilitate and has admitted to the press that she made a mistake. Thank you so very much, Julia. Um, Jamal Jr. would like to speak, uh, Mumia Abu Jamal's grandson. Hello, um, thank you all for joining in this Zoom and this conversation. Um, thank you very much. Um, Julie, you've been really, really instrumental in uh, you know, uh, bringing this fight from Umi Abu Jamal into, um, into the now. Um, we, all, we all know that corruption imbued with racism and other inequalities designed to work against non-white peoples in this country. We know that, right? You know, and that's on paper, that's on media. Um, this is not a conspiracy case, right? This is real. Um, this has been a real issue since this country was formed. And in the case of my grandfather, Mumia Abu Jamal, um, there's so many points of injustice that's been ignored by those holding the keys to my grandfather's release. Um, ignored because the justice system that again has robbed so many people of their time on on this planet, right? It, it, it doesn't want to look itself in the mirror. You know, Mumia is innocent, and there is if there's going to be any reconciliation um, in the state of Pennsylvania, like Mumia will be a free man. Um, this is my grandfather. You know, this man has my father's face and. You know, he's a man that's been an inspiration to so many people a world over. Um, and he hasn't just been an inspiration because of his words, his analysis, 
the injustices in his case has inspired so many people, right? It made so many people put their boots to the ground. And we we all have a job to do, right? And it's and it's really getting to the root of this this massive problem, you know, when it comes to the criminal and justice system. This massive problem where innocent people have to waste their entire lives behind bars because of this justice system you know, empowered by racism and really upheld uh, by people who are comfortable with uh, racism or straight up racist. You know, um, again, th- thank you all for, for coming. And, um, you know, we're, we're, he's going to be free because he is an innocent man. And much love to you all. Thank you, Jamal. And our hearts are with your family. Um, I would just want to read from the UN amicus brief before I hand it over to Vijay Prashad. It states, quote, this is a quote, presumed victims of racial discrimination are not required to show that there was discriminatory intent against them. Instead, the UN member state has an obligation to investigate and remediate discriminatory effects. Under international human rights law, the state has an obligation to confront and address ongoing racially discriminatory effects. This obligation is not mitigated by the age of a case or the fact these discriminatory effects may have persisted for decades already. The case of Mumia Abu Jamal may present such concerns. The courts, have an independent responsibility to a de novo review or a specific review in light of the possibility of racial animus, racial bias, or systemic racism that may have tainted the guarantee of a fair trial and due process. Dr. Vijay Prashad. Well, um, again, it's really interesting to listen to everybody, learned opinions, wise words, and so on. You know, institutions are made by human beings. They are social. They are not God-given. They don't come out of the earth. Um, we understand the problems of human frailty. We recognize a lot of the wretchedness and horribleness of human behavior. All of that is, I think, uncontroversial. If human beings carry forward a number of wretched forms of social life into the world, these are going to um, mark our institutions. And I wish and hope that in the world we live in, institutions would be a little less stubborn, a little less perhaps arrogant about themselves and be a little more compassionate about the fact that they are rooted in old hierarchies and might indeed reproduce them in pretty horrendous ways against the lives of innocent people. Uh, What I see often in our institutions is an inability uh, to look at themselves, to reflect seriously about their own failures. This is a good case uh, for just that. Now, obviously, there are victims. Obviously, there are people who are grieving. Um, But injustice is not sufficient as a balm against grief. Um, Injustice is never a balm uh, for grief. And I think it's that institutional arrogance that sometimes prevents us from finding out what really happened or short of what really happened, because that again requires a point of view not available to everybody. But it does prevent us from approximating uh, what really happened. And the name of injustice is the inability to approximate what really happened. And I think this is a case, as all the evidence shows, because so many people have looked at the evidence. It's a case of institutional insensitivity and institutional arrogance. And I really hope that human compassion plays a role here, as it must. Thank you, Prashad. Uh, Vijay Prashad, Dr. Vijay Prashad. In fact, the UN document uh, talks about the important uh, the importance quote of commitments to review and reinterrogate 
misjudgments that may only be apparent later. Speaks directly to your words. Thank you. We will hear next from um, Lynn Washington. I would just like to uh, follow up on what the previous speaker referenced as um, institutional arrogance. When we look at the Mumia Abu Jamal case and we just center it just in 1981, there was uh, four very high profile um, murders that took place in that year. One involving a, a doctor or dentist, uh, one involving a police officer, not Officer Daniel Faulkner, um, one involving a mob member, and then of course the um, a matter involving Mumia Abu-Jamal. All three of the cases beyond, uh, other than Mumia Abu-Jamal, it was found that police and prosecutors engaged in gross misconduct. Um, and are we to believe that when you have this gross in, in, in wrongdoing by police and prosecutors in these four high profile murder cases, that the only one that did not have a single instance of impropriety as the Mumia Abu-Jamal case, that just doesn't make any kind of sense at all. Uh, and let's be clear that one of the other instances where it was supposedly a case of open and shut guilt involved the murder of a, a black police officer and the jury acquitted the person that was on trial because of the extraordinary problems that existed in it. One man was actually put on death row. He was charged with killing a, um, a mob member in Philadelphia. He spent 1,375 days on death row before his case was overturned when it found out that uh, when the DA's office acknowledged that there were like serious shortcomings in it. So the issue of injustice in the Abu Jamal case is like 40 years overdue. And if in fact people feel that he is guilty as charged, then give him a fair trial. Let there be a fair trial. And you know, let the chips fall where they may. But what has happened over the last 40 years is contortions that have denied him the access to a fair and equitable proceeding that others, I mean, dozens of others have received. Um, Lynn, thank you so much for those remarks. I'd like to remind our listening audience that Mumia Abu-Jamal was an award-winning radio journalist at the time that this happened. He, in fact, received a prestigious award for his coverage of the Pope's visit to Philadelphia. Um, one of our members, Gwen, um, said in a meeting, a Black award-winning radio journalist killed a police officer who's mild-mannered? That doesn't make any sense. Had this been an award-winning white radio journalist accused of killing a white police officer, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Um, Michael Schiffman, briefly, and then we'll give it to the judge. Okay. Uh, I can uh, only confirm what some of the speakers have already said. And the gist of that was uh, actually uh, justice for Danny Faulkner and uh, justice for Mumia Abdul-Jamal are basically one and the same thing because we need to look at the truth in this case. And the truth in this case uh, can only be discuss discovered if there is an evidentiary hearing, which leads to a, a new trial, if uh, the prosecutor finds that necessary. And uh, then we go into the depth of an investigation, which has been spoiled from right from the, and distorted right from the beginning. And that is something that needs to be rectified in order to get justice and uh, peace for all. And the final word we give um, to the judge Judge Wendell Griffin. It is often said that to whom, to whom of a much is given, much is required. I remind judges in Arkansas and elsewhere when I talk to them, and I talk to lay people, that judges have the longest terms of any elected officials or any officials, political offices in our democracy. And that's for a reason. 
they are expected to exercise the independent courage and be free from domination, from crowd control, from mob pressures. They're expected to make the right hard decisions. Judge Clemens has a good hard decision to make. It is a good decision in that it is a decision to say there was wrong done in this man's case. It was wrong to conceal the evidence from his defense team. It was wrong for him to be tried and convicted on concealed evidence. It is right for us to consider that evidence, and it is right to overturn his conviction. The hard thing is for her to look her colleagues and the police culture in the face and say, these wrongs do not get righted by ignoring them. They get righted by declaring them wrong and requiring that they be fixed. And the only way to fix this is to grant Mamiya freedom and require a new trial. That's the hard thing, but it is the right thing. To whomever much is given, much is required. Judge Clemens has a duty to do the right thing. And it's our job to call her to that duty and say, you can do this. You can do this. You must do this. And we are with you as you do it. Thank you very much, everybody. And have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Recording stopped.